So let's move to the lecture today, and it's got to do with whether an electron, and for that matter, a quark, uh, an atom, are those those do those qualify as geometric figures? I mean, are we talking about spheres, balls? What are we talking about here? Is is the electron a little tiny bead, a little round bead? Is it because that's how we always draw it, by the way? Okay, we draw it as a little point particle that goes around, you know. And so I think a good place to start is finding out what a point particle is. How is it defined? What do we understand when we say point particle? And it's got the word point, which obviously belongs to geometry, right? The word point. Never been defined, but everybody uses it, okay? Okay, so let's start with a point particle. Let's find out what this is first. Okay, point particle. This comes out of the um, uh, Wikipedia, okay? It says an idealization of particles heavily used in physics. I don't know about physics. Maybe in mathematical physics, which ain't physics at all, okay? Mathematical physics is one thing, physics is something else. Okay? The difference is mathematical physics describes and has ridiculous, irrational physical interpretations. Physics is part of science, and in science we only allow rational explanations. Okay? So there's a big difference. So mathematical physics is mostly descriptions, mathematical descriptions, and irrational explanations. Nothing at all to do with science. And defining, its defining feature is that it lacks spatial extension. Well, if it lacks spatial extensions, it looks like they're defining nothing, the word nothing, right? That sounds like, well, that's what it sounds like to me. When you say something that doesn't have spatial extension, you know, no, no body, no zero dimension, no, no radius, no diameter, well, what are you talking about? No, no length, uh, no size. Uh, I think that's the definition of nothing, not of something, okay? And uh, so the question is whether you can do physics with nothing. Are you going to move nothing around? Okay, so um, it says, being dimensionless, it does not take up space. Again, it looks like they're defining space itself, which is nothing. Okay? A point particle is an appropriate uh, representation of any object whenever its size, shape, and structure are irrelevant in a given context. Uh, that's got nothing to do with physics. That's got to do with math. Because the person is, uh, or the mathematician, right, is, is the only, only trying to describe something, and he doesn't care about what the thing really is. So it doesn't matter to him if it's a snake, a lion, a shark, a bird. He doesn't care because he's going to talk about mass, force, energy. He's going to talk about stuff that has nothing to do with physics, only to do with mathematical physics. And the physics part is too much. It's just mathematics. Okay? He's just going to be describing something. He says, I measured, and this is the equation. That's got nothing to do with physics. Physics, we have to understand the mechanism. That's what physics is about. And it says, far from enough uh, away, any finite size object will look and behave as a point-like object. Well, that's an observer-centered uh, or related type uh, description. Okay, Because what they're saying is, if you're far enough, it looks like a little point. So, uh, you know, the Andromeda galaxy shows up as a little point in the sky, and it's bigger than the Milky Way galaxy. In the uh, local uh, group, the Andromeda galaxy is the biggest galaxy. And to our eye, it looks like a little dot in the sky, if you can see it, on a good day. So the question is, uh, are we going to look at what the observer perceived, or are we going to analyze what the Andromeda galaxy is, in fact? A bunch of stars, gazillions of them, you know, rolling around a center. That's a little different than saying, well, it's just a dot in the sky. So these people are going to talk about the dot in the sky and how much mass that dot in the sky has. And that's good in math, maybe, but it's not good at all in physics. In physics, we have to deal with what the Andromeda galaxy is in reality if we're going to explain a mechanism. For example, how it spins, what, it, what its magnetic field looks like or, or does or whatever. That's what we're interested in physics, not in saying, well, it, it has so much mass and it pulls uh, gravitationally on the... Um, Milky Way galaxy with such and such force and such and such energy. What is that? It's just a description. And again, observer related. In the theory of gravity, physicists, not physicists, but mathematicians, mathematicians as we call them, uh, often discuss a point mass. Yeah, we don't care about point masses. Meaning a point particle with a non-zero mass and no other properties or structure. Well, we got a problem there because if it's, uh, um, it's a point mass and it's got mass, and they're saying it's got no size, it's actually nothing there. Well, how can nothing have mass? And I thought mass, the definition of mass was, uh, you know, that it's um, a quantity of matter or a, or a measure of quantity of matter. These people say it doesn't have any matter because they don't care about the object itself. They don't care about the body. 
They're not going to be dealing with a body because they have no purpose for a body. They can't put a body in an equation. So what are they going to put in there? Well, it's weight, it's mass, it's length. Okay, whatever. They're going to put a number in there with uh, with a uh, unit. And so they don't care about what the thing itself looks like. And that's going to haunt them in both relativity as well as quantum mechanics, not to mention string theory, which is also a mathematical theory, by the way. Not even a theory, it's just a description. Theories are explanations. Explanations are theories. In quantum mechanics, an elementary particle, also called point particle, such as an electron, quark, or photon, is a particle with what? No internal structure. The size of an elementary particle is exactly zero. Okay, so here we're dealing with physics. Physics, first and foremost, requires an object. You can't do physics without an object. What is there to see? What is there to measure? What is there to experiment in the lab if, if you consider experiments part of science? What are we going to do with a zero-dimensional nothing? So, no, uh, that's not true for physics. In physics, we need an object. That's the first rule of physics. These people are doing physics without objects. That's the problem, okay? And yeah, we have a little bit of problem with that when people start you know, doing physics without something, without a, a thing in front of you, okay? So what the mathematicians have invented, okay, is this thing called infinitesimal, infinitesimal. And what is infinitesimal? Well, as you can see, it's a mathematical notion, okay? And they apply it to size as well. The farther you go, the smaller Andromeda gets. The farther you go, the ant gets smaller, and so on down the line. You know, you want to see your pen look like a little dot? No problem. Just put it out in the horizon in the distance, and your pen will look infinitesimally. Okay, infinitesimal. So it says infinitesimals, or infinitesimal numbers, right? What are we talking about? Math, right? Quantif quantities that are closer to zero than any other standard real number, but are not zero. So they have this notion where something approaching zero, in any sense, could be in the zero size, zero mass, zero length, zero radius. As it approaches zero, they say, well, that's infinitesimal. The problem with the word infinitesimal is they use it as a synonym of zero whenever it's convenient. So when you want to say zero sometimes in math, well, you say, well, it's infinitesimal. It's getting infinitesimally smaller. Okay, And again, that's an observer-related issue. It's like, I can't see the atom, so it's infinitesimally small. Okay, that's how they, they uh, deal with it. But then they say, what's well, a point particle? Oh, what's a point particle? Well, it's one that has no size. So now we went from infinitesimal and we equated it to zero size. You see how this is, how the language is used in mathematics, mathematics, in mathematical physics? They equate infinitesimal many times with zero. And they give you the idea that, well, that's an infinitesimal particle. And you say, okay, I understand. That's a very small particle. But then they jump the river and they go on the other side and they say, well, it's a point particle. Oh, what's a point particle? Is it an infinitesimally small particle? No, it's a zero size particle. No volume, no nothing, except mass, charge, and all the other good stuff. Okay, because the body is not important for a mathematician. Okay, and there's another um, version, incalculably, exceedingly, and immeasurably minute, vanishingly small. Okay, so those are the notions people have with this strange word called infinitesimal. And uh, parallel to that, I mean, where did they get all this stuff, or how are they using this? Well, here, here you see uh, how calculus developed, essentially, okay? And it has to do with this notion of the limit, okay, uh, that they created in mathematics. It's, uh, you could say it's the foundation of calculus. It's uh, the value that a function approaches as the input approaches some value, okay? And so as um, x approaches 0, what happens to f of x, the function of x? That's essentially what it's all about. And this is what they turn into this infinitesimal thing, okay? Because they're not concerned, again, about structure or body or things. They're just concerned about doing calculations. And that's how particles became infinitesimally small, meaning point particles, meaning zero size, okay? So uh, what, what particles do we have? Well, we have these electrons, and they are point particles. They're considered to be point particles. In other words, zero size. Why? Because they're not going to take the size or the, or the uh, diameter or the radius of the uh, electron into consideration, or, it's, or if it's got constituents, something smaller than that that comprises the electron. Okay? Uh, and uh, that's not the only one. You have the gluons, you have the uh, quarks. They're all point particles. They're all zero-sized particles. Why? Because they can't see them. And so they say, well, they're there. We don't know their size. We don't know their diameter. We don't know what they're made out of. 
And they just call those point particles, or elementary particles, or fundamental particles. These are the words that they use. What are they referring to? Infinitesimal particle, meaning zero size particles whenever it's convenient, whenever it's useful. Okay? So this is how the language is going to be treated. And if you're not careful, you may be hearing one thing, understanding another. Okay? So here's, a, here's an infinitesimal particle. I mean, you know, how, how they determine these things sometimes is, uh, for example, a specific case, uh, Rutherford, Ernst Rutherford, he went in there and he shot uh, particles at uh, what he thought was a gold, well, a, a gold foil, which he thought was primarily, you know, full of holes or whatever, but there was obviously material. He expected some of these particles to go through, something bounce back. But, you know, some of them hit right in the center and bounce back. And so he says, oh, there's something in that center of where this particle hit. And he figured out that way that an atom is mostly empty space because most of them went through, but some of them bounced against the proton, which was allegedly in the center, or against some nucleus in there uh, comprised of uh, protons and neutrons, and the particle bounced back. Okay, it's that backscattering experiment. Well, here, here's a case that I can show you. Okay, here's a spider's web, and the spider's in the center. And you take some tiny, very tiny pebbles, and you throw it at the spider and spider web. Well, if you throw it through the holes, you know, between the the uh, little web there, uh, the particle goes through. And uh, when you throw it at the center, you know, probably hit the spider and the particle bounces back. Your little uh, grain of sand or whatever you threw at it bounces back. So does that show that um, the web does not exist there, that it's mostly empty space because most of the grains went through the holes? They could even rip some of those little uh, connections there. Uh, because maybe they're not strong enough to withstand a pebble, and so it goes through, and you say, okay, they all went through, except when I hit it in the center, and then it bounced back. Does that prove that the proton, the center of, the, uh, of this web, is a solid particle? Or does it prove, maybe, or could it be interpreted as being a web, okay, that, um, and, and we just managed to hit the center, and when it hits the center, it bounces out, back to you, and when it doesn't hit the center, it goes through. So is the atom like that, maybe? Maybe it's not all empty space, as Mr. Rutherford concluded. And what if it's like this? OK, here we have a, uh, the 3D version, OK? 3D version of a spider's web, OK, all over the place. And so you shoot a particle, and it turns out it goes through most of those holes. But when you shoot it in closer to the center, well, it bounces back. Now, if, if the atom looks like that, uh, did you figure out that an atom is just a little dot in the center and a lot of, another one rolling around, which is what the planetary model says? What if an atom looks like that, somehow like that, somewhat like that? Yeah. So again, this uh, notion that perhaps uh, we have a little tiny bead called the electron rolling around somewhere in the what is known as the um, energy levels of an atom, you know, the orbitals, uh, and at the center you have the proton ball, and then in between you have absolutely nothing, which is the planetary model, even to this day. That's the one they use for electricity, for ionization, for quantum jumping. Uh, maybe they've got the wrong model. Maybe the model has to be looked at again, revised. Okay. Here's the proton today. And we, let's go with that first. Okay. And the proton is made of these uh, three quarks. But it turns out that the quarks are point particles, according to the standard model. If you look it up, you'll find out that the quarks are point particles, meaning no size. And by the way, they're held together by these bed springs. <laughs> I call them bed springs, and uh, they're known as gluons. They're these uh, strong force. They mediate the strong force. And those bed string springs are also regarded or considered or taken to be uh, zero dimensional. In other words, uh, they're point particles. So we have this uh, proton, and it's made of three quarks point particles, nothing there, which are held together by bed springs, which are point particles, which is nothing there. It sounds like the proton is absolutely nothing. And yet the proton is said to have a diameter, a radius. It's made out of these three nothings, which are held together by three by lots of nothings, a bunch of point particles everywhere. Does that make any sense? Because that's what quant that's the official version of quantum, physical interpretation. They have no idea what a quark looks like or what a uh, gluon bed spring looks like. Okay? They, they, they treat them as point particles, except when they have to draw them to mislead you to think that they've got the right physical interpretation for what happens inside a proton 
or a neutron for that matter, because they're also made of three quarks. And here's uh, the uh, proton in action. Okay? That's what it looks like. So they have these zero-dimensional bed springs holding together three dimen uh, zero-dimensional quarks. And all of this uh, zero-dimensional nothingness is what the proton is, or made of, or whatever. So you figure out what a proton is. And that's the proton, which is the big guy. Let's look at the electron now, because that's the one we're going to be analyzing. Here's a Swedish electron. Okay? <laughs> uh, you say, Swedish, Bill? Yeah, Swedish University proved, filmed the electron in motion. Here it is. Okay? Oh, fell on the other side. Hold on. Give me a second. Uh, let me go. Ah, I lost it completely. Oh, here it is. Give me a second here. There it goes. Okay, here's the Swedish electron. Okay, that's what they filmed. And this is a real film, okay, that they claim to have made. What did they film? If the electron is a point particle, zero dimensional, no volume, thingy, that's got mass, no structure, no uh, body. They filmed it, and then they say it's a, uh, what is an elementary particle? It's one that is not made of smaller parts. Fundamental particle is not made of anything. They, they cannot figure out what it's made out of, so they say it's not made of anything. It's like, the buck stops here. You know, this is the particle that makes up everything else, so so to speak. And there you see all these little lines, like if it were made of little pieces. This electron uh, has different layers. It looks like nested layers. What does it look like to you? They say they filmed the electron. How could they film the electron if it's zero dimensional? How can that be the electron if it's a fundamental elementary particle, which means it's not made of anything? When this one is made of, obviously, patently. Uh, made of all these nested whatevers, whatever those are. Okay, so this is this is the issue. They, these people just print that, and people buy it like candy. You know, they say, "Oh, okay, they proved that they in Sweden, Sweden, they should get a Nobel and so on down the line." What are we staring at? Is that an electron? What is that? How can they film an electron? And they say, "Well, we did because we had these uh, fast uh, cameras, etc., etc., etc." And then they define the electron as a zero-dimensional point particle. Aside from the fact, aside from the fact that, you know, uh, the electron moves around the proton, right, in the hydrogen atom. And okay, let's concede that, then why doesn't that electron fly away? Doesn't it, why doesn't it fall to the nucleus? What keeps it bound around the proton? That's the issue. Okay, so all these issues have never been answered, and they never will be because, you know, the model is screwed up. Okay, so here is... Uh, the model they show you, they show you something like that. You get the three uh, quarks in the center uh, forming the proton, okay? And you have the electron blue one there uh, going around. As you can see, it's going from energy level to energy level, from uh, orbital to orbital, okay? As it falls, it releases energy. That's that green arrow going out there. And when energy comes in, it pushes the electron to a higher level or higher orbital. That's the model that, that's the official model. And you'd say, okay, so is that the, uh, that's the model with which we operate? Well, the, the problem is that if all these are zero-dimensional, this is what the model looks like. And I'm being kind with a proton because there shouldn't be a proton there if it's made out of zero-dimensional particles. And the electron, you know, I don't know where that went because it's zero-dimensional. We have a zero-dimensional nothing orbiting at different orbitals, which are concepts, a uh, particle in the center, which is made of nothing. Uh, we have three nothings, known as quarks, and they're uh, held together by three nothings, or many nothings, known as gluons. That's the quantum atom. That's the official quantum atom. Okay, so, what should we conclude? Well, is the electron a uh, geometric figure? Does it qualify as a, I don't know, a sphere, a circle, maybe a cube? I don't know. I mean, let's find out. These are the conclusions. Okay. The quantum electron does not qualify as a geometric figure, okay, under any definition, okay, we have the Euclidean definition, he defined that a figure is that which has a boundary, and boundary is that which is the border of a figure, so he had a circular definition, but uh, electron doesn't fit either of those two descriptions, okay, uh, the electron uh, falls, uh, fails the C-touch definition of figure of mathematical physics, that's the one uh, mathematical physics operates by, that's the one they use, that uh, an object is that which you can see or touch. You can't see the electron, you can't touch it, especially a zero-dimensional one, so it fails that definition as well. The electron uh, uh, fails the shape definition of science and physics, which is that which has shape, something that uh, has zero dimensions and not a something. Okay, No volume, that's not a something. It has to have volume, it has to have uh, shape. 
It's got to be something there. Otherwise, it's not an object. And if it's not an object, it doesn't belong in physics. Maybe in math, I don't know. I don't know what they do over there, but that doesn't belong in physics or science. And then um, the electron is specifically defined and described as a zero-dimensional point or elementary or fundamental particle. Okay? So that's the electron. That's the formal definition of that. And so if, or description. So if that's the description of an electron, you know, again, what are we talking about? We're talking about nothing. And so the conclusion is the electron is a non-entity, let alone a figure. It's nothing. So far, we have nothing in front of us. Okay? And so let me show you the electron, the famous electron. See what it looks like? The, the one from quantum, okay? I'm going to show you the quantum electron. Here it is. I can get it up here. That's what the electron looks like right underneath the arrow, okay? So if that's a geometric figure, as far as you're concerned, well, then you do have it. You, you know, you have the electron is a, a thing. It's a figure, okay? But if you see nothing underneath there, well, then the electron is absolutely nothing by definition and by description and also, you know, the way they use it because they don't care about bodies anymore. They just care about what number they're going to put in an equation.